Right. So um, I'm Jacob. I'm a neurology registrar, ST5, working in the southwest of England, currently working in Plymouth. Um, I don't know how many of you are here last week um, uh, when I did a, a similar type of session focused on the actual kind of diagnosis of, of a seizure and the differential diagnosis of that. Um, now I'm going to do a talk kind of focusing more on people with, with an established diagnosis of epilepsy. Um, and so for those of you who were there last week, you might get a little bit of deja vu about the structure, um, but hopefully it worked okay last week. Um, so <clears throat> what this talk is about, um, I basically want to give you an overview of epilepsy. Obviously epilepsy is a pretty massive topic, so I'm not going to be able to go into all the details, but just the kind of real headlines about, about epilepsy, some of the terms we use, about how we diagnose it, um, and then a bit about the management principles, which I think are quite quite useful just for understanding kind of the range of epilepsy and what, and what we try to do in neurology in outpatients. Um, and then the second section, which I hope is going to be the bit that's kind of really kind of practically helpful for you, is about kind of managing common inpatient scenarios. So the ones I'm planning on focusing on are um, what you know, the kind of key points for people with epilepsy who present to the hospital because of a seizure, um, and then people with epilepsy who are in hospital for, for something unrelated, so another reason, but then have a seizure while they're in hospital. Um, we're also going to talk about um, kind of things we can do regarding anti-seizure medications for people who can't take them normally, particularly people who are nil by mouth. And then I'm just going to do a few kind of um, key points about some of the common anti-seizure medications that you'll come across. What this talk is not about, not about how to diagnose a seizure, which was last week. Um, it's not really about outpatient, ep outpatient epilepsy management, although I am going to give a, just a one slide overview of that. Um, I'm not going to talk about loads and loads of drugs or complex epilepsy syndromes, don't worry. Um, and it's not really about paediatric epilepsy just because I'm working adult neurology, although I think a lot of the principles would apply to paediatric epilepsy as well. Okay, so again, I'd like to start off with just a few interactive multiple choice questions to check there's people out there listening and just to get you thinking. So if you're able to get your phones or computers out and go to vvox.app and type in that session ID, you'll then be able to <clears throat> give. Uh, live responses to a few of the MCQs that are coming. So I'll just give you a minute to do that. So, you know, there's not really any right or wrong answers to these. It's just to get you thinking, and then we'll do the bulk of the talk, and then we'll have the same questions at the end to see if people have changed their minds. Okay, so the, the session ID does come up when the actual questions come up. So if you haven't had a chance, don't worry. Um, but hopefully most of you have. So, cases. 64-year-old man, this is someone who's had epilepsy for a long time, 20 years, and he's really well controlled, so he's not had any seizures at all for five years, which is brilliant. He takes a kind of middling dose of sodium valproate twice a day, and he's an inpatient on the respiratory ward. He's also got bronchiectasis, and he's got quite a bad infective exacerbation. Because it's bronchiectasis, he's got some funny bugs, so he needs to be on pretty heavy duty antibiotics with IV meropenem. A few days into, a, his, into his admission, he has a few seizures, so that's really unusual for him, and he's been taking his usual sodium valproate uh, during the admission. So, what would you do to prevent further seizures in this situation? If you're on call and you've been called to this person, he's had a few seizures, he's fully recovered, so there's no concerns about that. What do you think you'd do? Again, no right or wrong answer, just, just, just say what your, your gut feeling is. Okay, see what we're looking there. Okay, bit of a smattering. I think that's probably fair enough. So some of you, yeah. So some would increase the dose of valproate, some would add in something new. Some people would say, well, it's just the infection causing it, so let's keep treating that. Some would switch the antibiotics and some would call for help. Fine. Okay, case two, uh, 26 year old lady, again, has epilepsy, 
takes levetiracetam 750 milligrams twice a day and she's in hospital because of acute appendicitis so again something completely unrelated she's quite unwell she's vomiting she can't eat and she's actually nil by mouth anyway because we're planning to she's planning to have an operation tomorrow so what are we going to do with her anti-seizure medications we're going to switch her to IV levetiracetam, we're going to switch her to rectal levetiracetam, we're just going to wait until her operation is done, hopefully tomorrow, and then um, accept she's going to miss a few doses, or we're going to give her something different entirely, like lorazepam. Okay, so most people want to switch to IV and other time. Sounds fair enough to me. Okay, last one. Uh, this is a 19-year-old girl. This is someone, this is a this is a real one that's stuck in my mind um, from quite recently. Um, so she has kind of like a complex pediatric epilepsy syndrome called Lennox Gastau. Um, and she's had a lot of care under the pediatric epilepsy team and been in and out of hospital a lot. But as always happens, she's now transitioned to adult services, which is an entirely different team, um, different A&E, different epilepsy nurses, consultants and everything. She's on a few different anti-epileptics. And the first time she needs to get an emergency admission to the adult services is with a cluster of really bad seizures. So a recurrent seizures one after another. So basically she's in status epilepticus. She gets some IV lorazepam as per protocol and settles initially, but then they start up again. She gets some more lorazepam and then some phenytoin, but she's still seizing. I accept you probably wouldn't be dealing with this by yourself, but what do you think the next best step might be? And is this definitely more than one option to consider here? <clears throat> so we could give her a couple more IVs for the status, either IV valproate or IV levetiracetam. We could call intensive care and see if they would do a general anaesthetic to control her seizures. We could try and find her care plan and see if anything differently could be done in this situation, or we could give her some more benzodiazepines. Okay, again, a bit of a mixture, but most people are going for call ITU, which again, I think is very fair enough. Okay, so, oops. Okay, so that's just to get you thinking. So um, now for some information, and then we'll revisit those at the end. So very kind of broad, you know, key points. What is epilepsy? So epilepsy is just a predisposition to recurrent unprovoked seizures. Okay, that's all it is. It just means that people, it, someone with epilepsy is someone who can have seizures out of the blue for no particular reason. Uh, it's pretty common. So about one in a hundred people, which equals roughly 600,000 people in the UK and it can occur at any age you know we, we tend to think of epilepsy kind of more as a kind of childhood and, and young adulthood thing but really it can happen at any age and actually the most common time to have a new diagnosis of epilepsy now is in later life and over a quarter of people get epilepsy after the age of 60. In terms of a kind of diagnosis or kind of more you know, clinical diagnosis we would say that anyone who has two unprovoked seizures more than 24 hours apart that's enough to say that someone has epilepsy so you have to be absolutely clear that it's an unprovoked seizure and if you have a few all in one kind of 24 episode then, then we would just class that as kind of one episode so it has, that's why the 24 hours is there you can have a diagnosis of epilepsy after one unprovoked seizure if you're proven to be at higher risk than average of having more so after one unprovoked seizure, we generally say we've got about a 50% chance of having another one in the next 10 years. But if we can show with some investigations that actually you're at higher risk than average, so typically this is if we do a, a, an EEG and show some epileptic features or some brain imaging and show something structural that might be causing seizures, like some developmental scarring or, or a brain tumor, then that's gonna put you generally above a 60% chance of having another seizure, and that's the current accepted kind of definition of epilepsy. 
So an EEG can support a diagnosis of epilepsy, um, but you need a clinical diagnosis of seizures to, to make the diagnosis. And there's certainly lots of people with epilepsy who have a normal EEG. Epilepsy can resolve as well. So particularly some epilepsy, child, some childhood epilepsy syndromes, uh, people can grow out of, but also some adult onset epilepsies. Um, if you're seizure free for kind of between five to 10 years, you know, off medications, then, then you would say that it's resolved. So it's not always a lifelong diagnosis. Okay, just briefly, um, so let me get my pointer up. This is the kind of most recent classification of seizure types. You know, it is a little bit complicated, but basically you've got focal onset and you've got generalized onset. Um, and this has changed. So you might have heard the terms kind of partial seizures. So that is now a focal or focal onset seizure. I think it was more kind of acceptable to, to patients with, with focal seizures because partial makes it sound like it's maybe not as bad. Um, and the kind of the term kind of secondary generalization, we have a focal onset and then get a generalized um, seizure that's been replaced by focal onset, focal to bilateral tonic clonic. So it's just a slight change in terminology that came about in 2017. But you hear kind of all the terms used in general, but these are the most up to date ones. OK, a focal onset, you can be fully aware or you can have impaired awareness. And then there's all sorts of different epilepsy or the seizure types. Sorry. Um, so you, you get your kind of typical generalized onset tonic clonics, um, you can get focal onset um, uh, uh, clonics, um, but then there's a whole list of other things. You get autonomic features, behavior arrests, you can get hyperkinetic seizures. So if anyone's read Suzanne O'Sullivan's book, she describes uh, one of her patients with epilepsy who when they get a seizure just starts running and just runs and runs. So when it happens, everyone has to be aware to kind of lock the doors so she doesn't run out on the road. So you can get some really quite unusual seizure types. Um, but we won't dwell on the details of that, but that's just to make you aware of the most up-to-date classification of seizures. Um, and then moving on. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, well, we'll okay. Um, so in terms of causes, um, we can say that epilepsy is kind of it can just be one of those things, you know, it can be idiopathic, we don't have a definite cause, it's just something that someone develops and we don't find one absolute cause for the epilepsy. It's probably genetic, but it's probably a contribution of lots of different genes rather than just a single gene pathology. Um, or epilepsy can be secondary to something. So often it's something structural like a brain tumor or a head injury. Uh, cerebrovascular disease and strokes is really common, so that's often why patients who are more elderly develop ep epilepsy as well as dementia. Um, but also other things like previous infections like a viral encephalitis, those things can all be a cause of epilepsy. Um, this was a slide I thought was coming next with the last time. <laughs> so um, we kind of, you, you define a seizure type as on that last um, slide, and then you use that to describe the type of epilepsy. You can sometimes give an exact cause, if particularly structural, sometimes infectious, sometimes there's a single gene cause, but often we don't know. And in, and in some cases we can define a type of epilepsy syndrome. So that's kind of how epilepsy is described and classified. Okay. So one slide about the really important management principles of people with epilepsy. So first, as with anything in medicine, really, you should only offer someone treatment if the risk of that condition justifies it. OK, so anti-seizure medications have loads of side effects. Um, so there has to be a high enough risk of seizures without medications in order to justify that. Everyone with epilepsy should have access to a specialist team and particularly um, access to an epilepsy nurse specialist in addition to their medical team. In terms of drug control, drug um, use, so obviously our main arm for treating epilepsy is with medications. And what we'd always aim to do is to try and get people completely controlled on a single drug, okay, single anti-seizure medication. Exactly what medication we choose would depend on a lot of things, but in particular, whether it's focal or generalized onset, and then other people's comorbidities, gender to some extent, whether people can get pregnant or not, and how people have got on with previous medications and side effects. In terms of side effects, you'll often see that you know, people will build up anti-seizure medications quite slowly. 
And the idea of that is that it just reduces the side effects, okay? It makes people tolerate them better. So all anti-seizure medications um, will make people feel a bit tired, a bit dizzy, fatigued, um, drowsy sometimes, because they're all basically just dampening down nerve signaling at the end of the day. Um, and if, we, if you go in at a high kind of treatment dose straight away, those side effects can be really debilitating and then people just stop taking the medications. Um, so the idea of building up slowly is just to, just to in, improve tolerance of the medication. And then obviously if you're weaning someone off medications, you also do that slowly because you don't want to have the risk of rebound seizures. But our, our aim and our hope when someone is diagnosed with epilepsy is you get them on a kind of lowish dose of a medication with no side effects and they're completely controlled. And that's the ideal. There are plenty of people with epilepsy like that, okay? But of course, there's people where that is not good enough. And there's this concept of um, drug resistant epilepsy, which basically just means that you've tried good doses of two appropriate anti-seizure medications and you're still um, not free of seizures. And that affects roughly one in three patients from people with epilepsy. So it's a reasonable proportion, okay? In terms of what we do then, there's always the option of trying different medications. There is a long list of anti-seizure medications that can be tried, but we don't have great ways of predicting exactly who will, who will respond to which ones. And you can add in medications. As I'm sure you know, people are often on multiple anti-seizure medications. But the problem is that by the time you haven't responded appropriately to two anti-seizure medications, the chances you're going to respond to a third and a fourth just get lower and lower. It's a kind of law of diminishing returns. And you're always adding in side effects with medications, with more medications. Resective surgery can sometimes be a curative option in people with drug resistant epilepsy, particularly where it's where it's focal onset and it's due to something like a, a scarring or a developmental abnormality in one part of the brain. Um, so that's something that's done in kind of specialist epilepsy centers, um, which you might come across a bit. Um, I was just going to mention vagal nerve stimulators. So it's another kind of surgical option for people with drug resistant epilepsy. This is not the same as surgery because it doesn't cure people. Um, of, of, you know, it doesn't ever lead to complete seizure control, but it can have a really valuable reduction in seizure frequency. And there's lots of kind of new things coming with them now or newish, you know, so some of them are able to sense heart rate. So if the heart rate's going up and they think that might suggest a kind of a, an early seizure, then the stimulation can increase to try and stop it developing into a full seizure. Um, and patients with them can also have a magnet where they can kind of boost the signals if they feel, if they're having a cluster of seizures or something like that. Okay, so that's, um, that's my overview of epilepsy. And now we're going to move on to some common inpatient scenarios. So the first one is someone with a diagnosis of epilepsy who's presenting to hospital, normally in the emergency department, because of a seizure. So what are we going to do? First things, like last week, we're going to say, you know, is this episode of unresponsiveness, of jerking, of confusion, whatever it is, is it actually a seizure? Okay, it always has to be the first question. I think with someone with epilepsy, you're always going to think it's more likely to be a seizure than someone without, so you're starting off from that position, um, but you shouldn't ever assume. Always take the history from the patient and a witness of what happened before, during, and after the event. And then with someone with epilepsy, you want to do more information gathering. You want to know what their epilepsy, what their seizure types are like normally, because that's really valuable information for you to try and work out whether this is one of their usual types of seizures or if it's something different altogether. So the things you can look at are clinic letters. OK, they, they should describe someone's seizure frequency, someone's seizure um, type. And you can also, of course, ask the patient and the family, because at the end of the day, they are the experts in their chronic condition they will almost always be able to say if this is a normal type of seizure or if it's unusual. If someone says, yes, I have epilepsy, but it's really well controlled and what happened today was absolutely nothing like my normal seizures, then you really need to think hard whether this is something different, okay? And on those lines, just always remember that people with epilepsy can still get other things, okay? They can still get syncope. They can still get dissociative attacks. You don't want to miss someone with a dangerous arrhythmia causing them to faint, just putting it down to their usual epilepsy. If you think it is a seizure, then the next question is, have they been taking their medications? Have they missed any accidentally? 
um, because the most common reason for someone with epilepsy to have a seizure um, is because they haven't taken their medications as planned, okay? Think about other triggers as well though, alcohol, sleep deprivation, if they're unwell, if they've got an infection, if they've got low sodium, anything like that can, that can cause anyone to have a seizure is obviously gonna be more likely to cause someone with epilepsy to have a seizure as well. So if someone with epilepsy has had a kind of normal, normal one of their seizures that's not unusual for them, and they're fully recovered, you've done a full history, you've done an examination, which is normal, you've done the bloods with the electrolytes and blood sugars, and you've done an ECG and that's all okay, then those people generally can go home. If they do, then please remember to let the epilepsy team know, email the epilepsy nurse, let the registrar on call know, um, you can, often ask the patient or their family to do that but I think to be on the safe side you should probably do it yourself and, and then you know that it's been done then then they can be plugged in for early follow-up or a telephone call or, or, or something you know that then that their kind of chronic disease has been managed in the optimum way you don't have to make the decisions about that but but if we don't know that someone's been in then then we can't um, make any changes based on that I was just going to mention something about kind of drug levels um, so, you know, one of the most useful or well, one of the main reasons that we would do anticonvulsant drug le uh, blood levels would be to see um, whether someone has definitely taken their medications or not. Um, so I guess if there's any kind of uncertainty, if the patient's saying they did take them, but their partner's saying they don't think they have been, it can be really helpful just to get um, a one off um, anticonvulsant level on their admission bloods. Um, Things that are easy to do, so valprate, carbamazepine, phenytoin, they're all pretty routinely done. I think pretty much all hospitals can do that and have a pretty quick turnaround. Okay. Other anticonvulsants can be measured, those concentrations can be measured. So definitely levetiracetam and lamotrigine uh, and several others, um, but they often have to be sent off to different laboratories and they sometimes take many weeks to come back. So it's not going to change what you do there and then. But if you think it's an option, um, then I would certainly consider um, sending that. Or if you're not sure, just ask. Okay, so second, second um, scenario. So this is someone with epilepsy who's in hospital because they're unwell for something entirely unrelated to their epilepsy, um, but while they're in the hospital, they're having seizures, okay? So what's our focus gonna be there? Well, first, um, we need to make sure they don't have any ongoing seizures. Obviously, that, that is obviously the case for someone coming to the emergency department first and foremost, but I think it's a little bit harder in someone who's unwell for another reason, has maybe been admitted for over a week or something, um, because often someone can have a kind of obvious type convulsive seizure and then just remain drowsy and just be confused for a long time afterwards. And that might actually be little seizures that are ongoing that are not obvious, um, but are keeping them in that kind of unwell state. So if there's any sense of a kind of a really prolonged postictal state, so there's kind of ongoing confusion or delirium, then think about whether they're having ongoing seizures and think about in particular whether they're in non-convulsive status epilepticus, which is not as much of an emergency as convulsive status epilepticus, but is absolutely something that needs to be diagnosed and treated. The two options for diagnosing it, is, well, basically to try and get an EEG, and that will depend on your availability, okay? But, um, you know, I think certainly during working hours, most places will be able to get an EEG. Um, if you really can't get an EEG, um, then you're going to have to think about whether you just need to give them empirical treatment, so something like IV lorazepam, um, but definitely discuss that first because, um, you know, it can cause respiratory depression, they're going to need to be somewhere reasonably high observation, high visibility. So someone with epilepsy, having seizures, admitted for something else, um, you've made sure they're not having any ongoing seizures. The next thing we're going to do I'm going to sing a bit of a theme here. We're going to check their medications, okay? We need to know, are they on the right medications that they normally take and are they taking them, okay? You know, as with anything chronic, you know, epilepsy, Parkinson's, COPD, asthma, whatever it is, when someone comes into hospital, the last thing we want to do is make things worse by not giving them their regular medications and disrupting that chronic condition, okay? And it's pretty common with epilepsy. You know, sometimes there's confusion about the doses because people might be in the middle of going up or down on doses. Sometimes they're on some slightly unusual medications, are not so available, so they have to be ordered from pharmacy and take, you know, who knows how long sometimes. And sometimes people are unwell and they're not able to swallow the tablets that they're, that they're normally on. 
So you need to make sure they're prescribed, make sure the doses are correct and that they've actually been receiving them. And if they're not, we need to do things to correct that pretty sharpish, okay? Look at other medications as well, okay? And check for interactions. So as I'm sure you know, um, anti-seizure medications interact with lots of other um, medications. So it might be something we've given them like an antibiotic or something else that's disrupted the, the um, steady state concentration. And that might be a reason why they're having seizures. So a few just to look out for. So meropenem reduces the concentration of valparate a lot, you know, at least kind of two thirds. So it's a really significant reduction. Um, if in doubt, just check, you know, pretty much all the anti-seizure, pretty much all the older anti-seizure medications have some kind of drug interactions. And it's quite hard to remember them all. So if you're not sure, just go on the BNF, you know, free online web page, free online app, um, and just tap it in. And remember that some medications reduce seizure threshold in everyone, so not just people with epilepsy, although they're going to be the ones who are probably more prone to a reduction in seizure threshold because their seizure threshold is already lower than average. Um, and some common ones would be fluoroquinolone antibiotics um, and also opioids in particular, tramadol. So if you see those in someone um, having seizures, then we need to think pretty carefully about giving them something different. Okay, so after their medications, um, we then you know, need to look you know, at their epilepsy care plan or clinic letters or talk to the family about how their epilepsy is normally and how it's managed normally. So in particular, you might get some really useful clues like their usual seizure triggers. Are they photosensitive and they're sat next to a window with the tree kind of, you know, um, get into you know, branches kind of flicking through the sunlight? Do we just need to pull the curtains or move them away from the, away from the window? What's their usual frequency of seizures? You know, some people with drug resistant epilepsy have lots of seizures, okay? And unfortunately, that is kind of their, their baseline. So some people might have a seizure every day or you know every couple of days. So if that's what's happening in hospital, we don't need to go doing lots of things to try and change that, okay? Um, some of them, some epilepsy care plans in particular will be able to, and we'll describe kind of strategies, drug strategies often, you know, medications that, that, that um, the patient will respond to best if they're having a cluster of seizures. So that can be really helpful. And then finally, don't forget to think about other reasons for seizures like you would for anyone with epilepsy, okay? So all the usual things, do we need to treat anything specifically, hypoglycemia, alcohol withdrawal, do we need to do some other tests, okay? Fine, okay, so we've done someone with epilepsy coming into hospital with a suspected seizure. We've done someone with epilepsy having seizures while they're in hospital for something else. Um, and now the last one is going to be um, someone with epilepsy who's nil by mouth, so they can't take their usual anti-seizure medications. What are we going to do about that? Um, so first, you need to recognise it's a problem, OK? I think we probably all agree that someone with epilepsy who's just not taking the right medications for a few days is not going to go very well, OK? So we have to recognise it, and then we have to do something about it, OK? How are we going to get the usual anti-seizure medications into them? Or if we can't, are we, getting, we need some kind of alternative as a temporary kind of backup while we, while we um, hopefully they're in a position to, to take their usual medications again. And if you're not sure, ask for help. So senior on your team, neurology for advice, and pharmacists. So pharmacists are really helpful in this situation. Okay, They know the different formulations of all medications. They know what your hospital has. Okay, Because even if something's listed in the BNF as an IV formulation, it might be that it costs you know, hundreds of thousands and actually your hospital doesn't stock it. So there's no point in prescribing that. So pharmacists can be really helpful. This is a kind of take home message in this situation. So the only, probably the only one I think I'd expect the junior doctors, foundation year doctors to be doing is this one here, but I'm gonna talk about the other two just so you're aware of the other options as well. You know, so basically the easiest thing is just to switch their normal anti-seizure medication to some other kind of route, okay? Um, so if we can, we want to just write it up IV. So most of you said, you know, give the person um, who normally takes oral levotrastam, give it to them IV, and absolutely that's the right thing to do. Levotrastam is easy. All you do is do exactly the same prescription and you write IV next to it instead of PO, and then it's, it's exactly the same. So that is easy. Okay, Valprate's pretty easy as well, okay? Same dose, give it IV over three, uh, uh, over three doses in a day. Phenytoin, not many people are on that regularly, but you can just give it IV. And the Cosmide, uh, slightly less common, but again, a very easy one, you can just give it IV. So any of those four, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You just need to get the prescription and get the drug up and just give it to them as normal, okay? 
In terms of other options, there's a few with uh, orodispersible groups. So, you know, break it up, um, dissolve them in a bit of water, just put it in their mouth and they absorb it from in there. I mean, in particular, lamotrigine. So lamotrigine is a pretty good anti-epileptic um, and quite a lot of people are on it, but annoyingly, it doesn't have anything IV, um, but there is this orodispersible tablet. Okay, so that's good to be aware of. It'll have to be ordered from pharmacies and a little bit of forward planning and communication, but definitely remember that. Carbamazepine comes as a rectal suppository. So again, that can be really helpful. Um, think about an NG tube. Obviously, if someone's nil by mouth before surgery, you can't go and give them an NG and, and feed them. But if they're nil by mouth because they've had a stroke and, and their swallow isn't safe, then we just, you know, probably that, the best case would just be to put uh, an NG in. I mean, if they're a surgical patient and they've got an ileus and they're not absorbing, then that's probably not going to work, is it? Um, but definitely an option. So in terms of the other things, you know, if you haven't got any of these alternatives, uh, IV or orodispersible or rectal roots, um, you, there's this concept of a benzodiazepine bridge. So you could give something like IV lorazepam one milligram three times a day um, while we're hopefully correcting whatever it is that's stopping them from swallowing their usual anti-seizure medications. But, you know, it's um, something to just be cautious about, particularly in elderly people, you know, it can make people drowsy, reduce their respiratory drive. And I'll definitely discuss that before just prescribing IV lorazepam regularly. Um, sometimes what we have to do is just use one of these IV options and replace and use that in place of someone's usual anti-epileptic, okay? And then aim to just get them back onto their usual one as quickly as possible. Um, but that would need discussion probably with neurology or certainly with a, a senior on the medical team, okay? Those are your three general options. And this is the one that we need to be addressing um, in terms of junior doctors, um, in terms of getting it uh, sorted as quickly and easily as possible, if that is an option. Okay, right, I'm just going to run through a few kind of common anti-seizure medications and give my kind of take home points about them. Um, there are absolutely loads. I think I've just picked five, hopefully the ones that you're most likely to come across. Um, so levetiracetam, everyone's favorite, also known as Keppra. Um, it's really commonly used um, for quite good reasons. You know, it's a pretty good anti-convulsant. An, anti um, it's really easy because the PO and IV dose are exactly the same. So when people are unwell, that's what you need to do um, if they can't swallow. You can use it in status epilepticus, you know, after your benzodiazepines, that's an option, you know, uh, similar to how phenytoin is used. Um, it's basically got no drug interactions, which is really nice. Uh, that's the kind of dose range, so you've got a bit of an idea. Um, and in terms of side effects, yeah, long-term outpatients, mood problems, the big one. I think if you're giving it to someone for kind of new seizures in hospital, Probably drowsiness is the one you're going to see the most, okay, particularly if you put someone on quite high doses at the start. Um, they might then be sleepy because of the levotracetam rather than because of recovering from the seizures, so just bear that in mind. Sodium valproate, been around for a long time, very good anti-epileptic, um, used in most seizure types. Um, again, kind of oral and IV dose is, is the equivalent, but you should give the IV dose over kind of eight hourly rather than uh, 12 hourly dosing just because of the it's half-life. Again, you can use it in status epilepticus. Um, it's a bit more complicated than levotrastan. There's loads of formulations, so people can be on epilim, epilim chrono, epilim enteric coated. They've all got slightly different absorption and kind of half-lives. Um, and it's also an enzyme inhibitor, so it's got lots of interactions. You know, it's a quite sort of dirty drug in terms of interacting with other medications, so you have to check for those. As we've mentioned already, meropenem significantly reduces the valproate level. Um, so always think about that if someone's on valproate and they're having meropenem. It doesn't mean you can't use it. You know, if they need meropenem, which is at the end of the day a very good antibiotic, um, then then you know they might just need it, and we're going to have to do something else, increase their valproate or, or add in another antiepileptic temporarily. Um, but just bear that in mind. Okay. And there's also this high risk of congenital malformations, which I'm sure you're aware of, which is why we don't use it um, in women of childbearing age. Lamotrigine, <clears throat> it's been around a little while now, I don't know, maybe 25 years or something. Um, again, it's pretty common, it's a good anti-epileptic, it's generally well tolerated. You know, I tend to think of it as quite a good one for outpatients, but it can be a bit of a pain for inpatients when they become unwell. So for outpatients, you know, they don't get very many side effects and it's generally quite effective, um, but you can't give it IV, but there is this oral dispersible option. Um, it's also 
something that has to be built up quite slowly. So it can typically take kind of six, eight, 10 weeks before you get to a proper treatment dose. So if someone newly has lots of seizures you're trying to get on top of quickly, it's not really that effective. It's got quite a lot of interactions as well. It's not as bad as valparate, but it does have interactions um, and it can reduce um, exposure to the combined oral contraceptive pill. Um, so again, it's one of those you probably just have to tap into an interaction, interaction checker if you're prescribing it or if you're prescribing a new medication to someone who's already on it. Carbamazepine, again, quite an old anti-seizure medication, pretty good, very good for focal onset seizures. Um, can't give it IV, but there are these suppositories available, so that's quite a good alternative. It's got loads of interactions, so please check them. Hyponatremia is pretty common. Okay, you'd often have a mild low sodium just kind of normally in someone on carbamazepine. Um, and it's got this rare side effect of agranulocytosis. So if someone was newly on it and came out, came in with no white cells and a bad infection, that's probably the explanation. Um, fine. And then finally, I was just going to mention a bit about phenytoin. I mean, basically the take home about phenytoin has got loads of side effects. And it's got loads of interactions. Uh, so it's not really used as a long-term anti-seizure medication anymore, although there are still a reasonable number of people who are on it kind of 20, 30 years ago and have just carried on because it does actually suit them quite well. Um, and it's still, when we see, it, we see it used mostly in hospital for kind of status epilepticus, um, so it's still common to use that. It's often still first line in most protocols, I think. Um, so you can obviously give it IV. Just be aware that there's quite a high rate of arrhythmias and, and hypotension when you're giving it IV. So the patient absolutely needs to be monitored, although usually when it's being given, they are anyway because they're on well with seizures. Um, and it's got quite complicated pharmacokinetics, which basically means you're a bit like warfarin, different people need different doses to get to the same level. And basically you need to do trough levels. So you take the blood just before they're due to take their, their next um, dose and then interpret that in terms of altering, altering um, doses or checking that someone's on the right amount when you initially start it. Okay, so that was everything that I wanted to run through. Um, so let's just quickly run through the cases again and I can tell you my thoughts on them and see if any of you changed your mind. Um, and then have a bit, a bit of time for feedback and things at the end. So this is our 64 year old man with well controlled epilepsy on valparate, being treated with IV meropenem because of an exacerbation of bronchiectasis and then has some seizures. So what are people going to go for this time? Okay, five seconds more. Switch on suppose. Okay, so that's been a bit of a swing. Again, a bit of a spread. I think hopefully you've got the point about meropenem reducing the concentration of sodium valparate, which was kind of the, the point of this question, although really just to highlight that, you know, if someone with normally stable epilepsy suddenly starts getting seizures as an inpatient, it's either because they haven't been taking their medications or because we've given something that interacts. I mean, in terms of whether you should switch antibiotics, that's going to depend on the bug they've got. Uh, if there's nothing else that's that it's sensitive to, you kind of going to have to carry it on and then probably we'd increase the dose of sodium valparate temporarily. Um, okay. Fine. So the second case is a lady who's on uh, levetiracetam and is nil by mouth because she's about to have her appendix taken out. So um, switch to IV, switch to rectal, don't do anything or give lorazepam. Yeah, okay, so pretty much everyone going switch to IV. Um, good, which was which was the most popular one last time. That's definitely the right answer here. I don't think there's any um any suitable alternative for this one. Okay, last one. Um, so this lady with uh, just transitions with complex epilepsy, kind of drug resistant epilepsy. We know that because she's on three medications and she's coming in status and she's not responding to the, the kind of normal hospital protocol of lorazepam and then 
finish her in. Again, no kind of definite right answer here, but a few things to consider. Okay. Okay, again, a bit of a mix, um, fine. So I think, you know, probably if you had to pick one here in an actual exam situation, it probably have to be called ITU, isn't it? Because in the protocol, it's always give lorazepam, give a second line agent like phenytoin and call ITU at the same time, because if that's not gonna work, they're probably gonna need general anesthesia. I think probably, probably the right answer for an exam would have been call intensive care, um, which we did do. Um, but while they were coming and having lots of complicated discussions about whether this lady with quite severe learning difficulties and bad epilepsy, you know, would be a candidate for long-term ventilation and anesthesia and things, um, her mum had come in and was basically saying, what on earth are you doing? Here's our protocol for what we do with, with her when this happens. We give her IV phenobarbitone and it always works, which you know, phenobarbitone is not really on very many protocols. It's a very old school anti-epileptic agent um certainly are not one that i would have been reaching for without this information uh but we gave it to her and she stopped seizing so i think i'll put this in just to kind of highlight the importance of trying to get the background information in terms of someone's someone's epilepsy what's worked in the past talking to the family trying to get information you know hopefully in this situation someone come in with a big sheet of paper that says this is what you do if i go into status um, but if it's not then you need to kind of look for it um, and she um, she did okay in the end. Great. Okay, so that's everything I had to say. Uh, I've got a few key points just to summarise at the end. You know, epilepsy is common. It's also really variable. Some people are walking around with one medication on a low dose, no seizures. Some people on five or six medications and still having seizures. So it's very variable. Um, remember that patients and families are the experts and they're own condition and expert patients. Um, if you can't talk to them or they're not able to talk to you, then clinic letters and epilepsy care plans are also really helpful. Missed medications are the most common reason for seizures in someone with epilepsy. So if you think they've had a seizure, that absolutely, absolutely has to be their next question. Always think about drug interactions, okay, particularly if you're giving someone a new medication. Um, and please keep anti-seizure medication going at all times. If you can, just switch it to IV. That's the easiest for everyone. But if you can't, you need to have a think about alternatives and ask for some help about whether we're going to give them some benzodiazepines or a different anti-seizure medication um, while we address the underlying problem. OK, great. Thank you very much. That's a QR code for feedback and your certificate of attendance. And if you've got any questions, I'm very happy to take them. Thanks so much again, Jacob. That was so helpful for just, uh, fortunately, having done four months of surgery, I never managed to come across the uh, the epileptic patient who didn't, <laughs> who was nil by mouth, but um, that is, yeah, phenomenally helpful. Someone said they can't scan the QR code. Uh, there is a link right at the top of the chat. And um, just remember you, um, if you fill out the feedback via the QR code, that's the way you get your certificate. Say you attended the session. So please fill it out. It's helpful for us and helpful for you. Um, we're just going to have a look through the chat now. Um, we'll go from the bottom upwards. So um, can a seizure cause brain damage is the first question. Uh, well, uh, yes would be the short answer. Uh, it would be, you know, ongoing ongoing seizures can do. You know, and the most emergency is convulsive status epilepticus because that's the one that in which you know the neurons are firing the most and kind of using up their metabolic demand so you kind of get you kind of get like you can get like an anoxic brain damage like a metabolic brain damage so that's why we need to get people out of status as quickly as possible uh, there's a lot we've got, we've got quite a few more people this time so there's a lot more comments to end up filtering through um so um is diazepam safe as a long-term seizure preventative? 
to the next one. Um, I mean, it's not used very commonly. Um, I mean, some sometimes it's necessary. It would be for kind of epilepsy. It's difficult to control with um, other medications. So I guess it's an option. There's another benzodiazepine called clobazam, which is a bit newer. I think it's only been around about 10 years or so. We use that a bit for people who kind of have a seizure because of something that's easily identified and reversible. So if someone's got a UTI and they've had seizures, we might give them some clobazam for say three days or something to get them over that that trigger. Uh, but 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 there are also some people who are on regular clobazam for epilepsy control. Yeah, that's it. I was going to say that's the one that I keep seeing in hospital at the moment. I always go, what what is this? But. Um, Cool. Um, I just want to think while we just wait, has anyone else got any questions? Feel free to stick them in the chat. I was just wondering in terms of the sort of, I don't know, in, suppose in the UK, is there anything that should trigger sort of um, as a sort of in like sort of internal medicine team thinking about um, or just sort of sort of DGH sort of neurology about sort of um, referring people on for sort of consideration of um epilepsy surgery and sort of care at sort of a more tertiary center i know you mentioned the sort of two anti-epileptic drugs but is there anything else that sort of you think should spark that sort of consideration i mean, it, I, mean I guess the first thing to say is it's generally you know something that's done out patients with neurology um I, I think the guidelines are basically anyone with drug resistant epilepsy should be considered for uh epilepsy surgery but I think practically, if you, you know, kind of talk to people who've only tried a couple of medicines about whether they want to have kind of major neurosurgery, then most people aren't keen and they quite, you know, would prefer to try some more medications. You've also then got the kind of issue about when, whether someone is actually kind of technically eligible, whether epilepsy surgery can benefit them. And that basically comes down to the imaging. So you need to have quite high quality imaging and see if there is actually an area of the brain that's abnormal and then you have to be really confident that that is where the seizures are coming from because the last thing you want to do is take a bit of someone's brain out and then you realize that the seizures are actually coming from somewhere else um, so you know that kind of workup tends to be done in a tertiary center but in terms of referring someone you basically need to have someone who's got drug resistant epilepsy um, where it's kind of compromising their quality of life and it needs to be focal onset and ideally have some kind of structural abnormality on the imaging that you've done, although it will probably be repeated at the tertiary centre and they need to be willing to engage with the process. Um, and it's quite a lengthy process. I think they all get kind of psychology and neuropsychology assessments. Um, so it's quite, a, you know, it's very in-depth and they have to be they have to be able to engage with that and, you know, willing to kind of go through it. Or often there's a lot of travelling involved as well because the tertiary centre might be a long way away. Um, and so, you know, you've got to weigh up those kind of risks and benefits for an individual patient. But, um, but, but, but the guidelines are to consider it for anyone who's just, you know, hasn't got control after two anticonvulsants. Um, just a few questions that come through. So uh, the first one is, do you see the use of medical marijuana in clinical practice? Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's certainly lots of people taking CBD oil, isn't there? For, I mean, maybe not so much for epilepsy, but some other conditions as well. Um, you know, I mean, it is licensed, isn't it, um, for certain forms of epilepsy? But I think, um, I think, I think hardly any prescription has actually been provided, have they, in the time that it has been? I think, um, yeah, I think when I was able to do so, it's not something I put. In the first year, they said they'd prescribed it to only about six people for the whole of sort of the King's College London sort of um, catchment area. So it's pretty pretty rare um, from what I've seen. Um, why does epilepsy seem to be increasing in dementia patients? That's the next question. Um, I don't know, but um, I. I would wonder if it's just to do with kind of increasing life expectancy, increasing kind of rates of dementia and kind of people surviving longer with dementia um, would be my thoughts on that. Uh, I don't know if you've got any other ideas, Alex, but that'll be off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I, I, I know, there was an article in Nature Neurology recently on the sort of topic on epilepsy and so dementia and the overlap between them, um, but it may just be the increasing prevalence of dementia. And like, like you say, um, 
the increased life expectancy that we're seeing. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I haven't read anything myself on that. Um, okay, there's a couple more and then we'll probably close the close session for today. Um, how would you approach an elderly patient who presents with two to three episodes of seizures now aborted? Um, would you start on an anti-epileptic and what would be your choice? At what strength? So I'm assuming that's kind of assume that that's kind of saying that they've kind of only had one episode because uh, maybe they've had three seizures within 24 hours. Because when I mean, if you had three seizures outside of 24 hours, and that kind of is a diagnosis of epilepsy. Um, um, often, kind of practically, you know, if someone's kind of elderly and they've got some structural brain disease, such as you know even just small vessel disease on a scan, or they've had a stroke, or, or they've got dementia. Then we'd often say, you know, even after a single seizure, that because there's that structural brain abnormality, that they're going to be at high risk of having further seizures. So we normally would recommend anti-seizure medications at that time. Um, exactly which one, you know, is, I mean, levetiracetam gets used a lot. I think, I think a, an advantage of it in elderly patients is that is the lack of interactions because often they're on other medications as well. Um, but so that's the one probably you get seen using the most but that or lamotrigine probably would be the two most common but valparate's used a bit as well you know there's no strong guidelines you've got to think about it in terms of the other medications that are on and there are other comorbidities okay um got, yeah there's just two more so if you had epilepsy as a child is it possible that it could come back I'm assuming this question is sort of asking if it's now regressed. Um, um, what, so if someone's kind of been seizure free for 10 years or something and they yeah. come off the medication, I mean, yes, because probably they've probably they've got a slightly lower seizure threshold than average and it may just be that, you know, they've had good control and potentially someone gets older if they acquire, you know, other problems, um, then certainly, you know, just because your epilepsy has kind of resolved at one point i don't think i don't think it would rule it out for the rest of your life you know as we know people can develop epilepsy who've never had it before over the age of 60 so yeah uh, a final question is after having a stroke and then um sort of only one sort of post-stroke seizure would you consider that person to sort of have an epilepsy diagnosis and a lifetime treatment uh, and all the sort of associated legal proceedings like driving limitations, et cetera? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, it, it depends on the timing of the seizure, basically. I think there's a kind of, I can't actually remember if it's seven or 30 days, but basically if you get early seizures after a stroke, that's probably just related to the acute insult. And then you might give them some anti epileptics maybe three months or something just to get them over that period. But certainly if someone gets seizures, you know, more than a month or so after their stroke, they're, they're very likely to have, you know, further seizures without medication. So that the key thing there is the timing, whether they're early or late after the stroke. Um, oh, this is actually quite a pertinent one for the sort of paediatrics uh, sort of crowd. So I'll just finish with this one. So is there still a correlation between febrile seizures and developing seizures later in life? I have to say I'm not. 100% sure on, on the kind of answer and data to that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think the fact that it's asked, is there still a correlation suggests that there is historical evidence that there may be a correlation somewhere. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know actually off the top of my head. I wouldn't like to just give an answer off the cuff without being sure, so sorry. All right, um, thanks very much again, Jacob. Thanks very much everyone for coming along. Um, our next session, we were trying to negotiate one for the 3rd of March, um, but I'm not sure that we've got anywhere with that at the moment. Um, the next one that we've definitely got booked in is on acute stroke on the 10th of March, so two Thursdays time. Um, so we hope you can join us then. Um, please sign up via Mind the Bleep for sort of weekly emails about the webinars that are going on, and we look forward to seeing you very soon.